Um, a couple of years ago, we got together with the Drug Development Roundtable and started to look at clinical trial outcomes and decided that each clinical trial had slightly different clinical trial outcomes for lower limbs. So we invested in an effort with, uh, that was led by Claudia Senesak from the University of Florida to standardize lower limb outcome measures. And those measures um, have been standardized and with the help of Tina as well, um, have been videoed and will be uh, posted and, and, and on the PPMD website and, and used in agreement with all of the um, members of the clinical uh, drug development roundtable for out, as outcome measures for their clinical trial. So, um, which was great because uh, slightly different clinical trial outcome measures were being collected by different trials at different centers, and this will eliminate all of that variability within those uh, lower limb clinical outcome measures. So, as I said, those were measures of lower limb, uh, which are wonderful for participants who are ambulatory and of an age that they could comply with those lower limb outcome measures. But now we're starting to investigate uh, trials that um, are for which uh, older boys are eligible who may not be ambulatory. So some of the outcome measures that we're starting to look at are measures of the upper limb, um, some MRI measures, and um, those are those uh, upper limb and, and MRI measures. So we're going to start to talk about this hour, some of these um, novel upper uh, limb and novel clinical trial outcome measures. So first we have Linda Lowe's uh, from Nationwide Children's Hospital, and she's going to talk to us about reachable workspace. Thank you very much. So reachable workspace volume, <laughs> by definition, it it's quantifies the accessible area around you. So how much of your environment right around you can you interact with? And it's dependent on the unique combination of your strength and your range of motion. We know that the decline in function isn't linear, that you hit a plateau and then you lose a function. So this is really how do you put your strengths and weaknesses together to see how you can interact with your environment. It's directly related to function because if you think about it, everyday activities have a required amount of, of functional volume that you need to accomplish. And for example, if you want to shampoo your hair, you need to be able to get up to a certain level. If you want to put on a shirt, we said that you needed 3.8 cubic meters, which is about 27% of your total volume. We looked at eating and drinking and typing and just trying to quantify how much you have to interact with your environment to do these activities. There's two current systems out there that, that have been used in Duchenne. Um, Lindsay Alfano and I have been working on ACTIVE, and um, Craig and Jane have been working on their RSA. We took two different approaches. Ours is more of a functional reaching volume, where theirs is a, does not allow compensations. It's an active range of motion of the shoulder flexion and abduction. And ours is video game based as opposed to being street clinical. So our goal when we started working on this was to be able to increase the enrollment pool for clinical trials. When I was new to the Shen community, we started a clinical trial. One boy was enrolled, the other's brother was not. So the family came time after time again, and only one brother participated. I thought that's really silly. We could expand the the population, that would be very useful. We wanted it to be a continuous measure from very able to very limited abilities. We wanted a continuous scale, had to be objective, very little training required, had to be portable and inexpensive. I have three teenage girls that I'm attempting to allow to live to adulthood. Um, <laughs> And someone told me that raising teenagers is like trying to nail jello to a tree. Um, testing kids is, can sometimes be similar. So we wanted something, you don't know who's going to show up, but we wanted something motivating to ensure that we get consistent performance. When we asked in clinic, this is what we came up with. So we wanted to have buy-in. So we did, we thought we were being great, and we were going to do a survey of all the boys in the clinic and decide what they thought that this game should, should look like. You are not allowed to kill things at Nationwide Children's Hospital. <laughs> so we also knew that motivation across the abilities is important. 
someone who has very limited abilities wants to feel successful in this activity, as well as someone who has high abilities wants to be challenged. So in our game, you either squish spiders or you hunt for jewels. Apparently you're allowed to kill spiders, but nothing, nothing of a higher level. So you squish spiders and dig for jewels, and what we do is based on your brook level or how much ability you have, we move the spiders. So if you have very limited ability, the spiders come very close, so you can get as many points as your siblings. In fact, the all-time high leading scorer is a 13-year-old with SMA, and so he's, he's quite thrilled with himself. So here's our system. You'll notice that first it's going to calibrate the distance from the connect to that little boy. And when he moves, oh, why is the avatar not moving on the other side? They're supposed to both play together. Can you restart it and make them both play together? You'll have to stop them both and make them play at the same time, please. As the boy moves, the avatar on the screen moves, and he has these laser arms that, that spiders come creeping out of the walls, and he, he kills them. So I don't know why this isn't working today, but that's his, that's his ability. Now, if you all do me a favor and stick one of your arms straight out in front of you and hold it there until, until I tell you to let it go. So to, in order to make our system be able to be used across time and within different individuals, we scaled it to the, the length of their, of their arm span. So my arm span is large, Tina's is not. We would both get percent predicted of our ability. So based on our arms, that's what we would, we would scale it so that we could compete equally. Our trial is only 70 seconds. You have not hit that yet. So it is very fatiguing, so keep them out there. So then, based on what we have as our predicted volume, based on our length, we take our raw volume and divide it by the percent predicted, and then we get an idea of how much of our available space. You can put it down now, that's probably about 70 seconds. It's a very strenuous 70 seconds. So then we know how much of your available space you can interact with. If you hit, can you just move your arms in complete range of motion, you get about 100%. If you're able to use your trunk, get quite a bit higher. So there's a little girl who was kind of demonstrates where her quadrants are. We look at six quadrants. We have right and left and then we have tabletop area up to shoulder height and, and above shoulder height. And when you're done with the game it spits out a report that tells you your total volume percent predicted and how far you lean in meters right and left and towards the front. Then you get visual representations of where where your areas are that you're able to reach. Um, on the back end, there's a large Excel file with all kinds of additional information that you can use. It looks at maximum excursion uh, of every quadrant, and so there's more that we can pull up. When we looked at this, we noticed that it was able to differentiate well between controls and boys based on their work level. This is from a publication we did a couple years ago and it really differentiates nicely based on your abilities. But none of the boys, even the boys who have a book level one, which is able to raise your arms straight up over your head, which is a, a, compared to a typical person, never reach quite the level of the healthy controls. We attribute this to the trunk movement. If you notice the way the Gower sign, how you climb up your leg, the one trunk weakness is a really early sign. And so we think we picked that up um, because it's related to your performance on the six minute walk test, it's related to time to rise, stair climbing descent, and to the pole. So we, we think we're capturing a good functional measure that can span quite a, quite a variety of kids. We looked at how it related to parent report measures. And so the promise is a I, parent report developed by the NIH. And the Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Index is a standard physical therapy kind of measure. And we got nice correlations both for the parent report and the, and the patient report. When we look at the PD, it has four sections. Daily activity, mobility, cognitive and social responsibility. 
And we, this is, we were highly correlated with their ability to perform functional activities, but also with both their mobility skills and their social skills, which we thought about a lot and thought, well, I guess if you're able to get places and you're able to get into the movie theater and you're able to get into somebody's car, that makes sense that your abilities would be related. It was not related to the responsibility at all, which we would expect. We looked at a change over time, and we noticed in six months we have about a decline of 7%, but with a large standard deviation. And test retest over one day, we have ICCs of 0.9. So we're, we think the, mode, the game is engaging enough that it ha helps them to do their maximum performance every time. This is what you need to do it. If we put it on a little rolling cart with the, with the television and the connect it. And it takes 70 second trials. We've been to the drug qualification, drug development tool qualification program and submitted an initial briefing packet and got their feedback. So we're attempting to get it this summer, get all of our data and to have it as an improved um, drug development tool. I'm sorry. Um, it's currently being used in some clinical trials in DMD, spinal muscular and myotubular myopathies. So, um, I guess we're saving questions till the end. So now we'll have um, Craig McDonald, a physician from UC Davis, come up and talk about his reachable workspace as well. I'm going to uh, briefly comment on some new analytic approaches used for old outcome measures and then go into our virtual workspace analysis. One thing we've learned that with much with many of the endpoints that are being used with Duchenne dystrophy, we're learning a lot as these endpoints are being applied across clinical trials. The North Star Ambulatory Assessment is actually a Duchenne specific measure that, um, that actually assesses 16 different uh, functions. Uh, from those that are more difficult and lost early in the course of the disease to those that are less difficult and lost uh, later. But what's, uh, what you can look, view these at is, is really uh, milestones or functions which can be lost uh, over the course of the time. And so if you were to just add up the total uh, numbers of scores across these 17 functions, you actually lose a lot of information. And so a more recent approach has been to actually look at a shift of function from uh, a normal or a, a two uh, or a one performing each function with difficulty to a score of zero. So this represents complete loss of a function and represents loss of a clinically meaningful milestone. And just to, uh, to demonstrate this, if you look at the PTC, I've actually presented this publicly recently, but if you look at the PTC uh, placebo-controlled data, the, the recent Adelarne trial, uh, the, the total score uh, actually uh, looking at Avalon treated patients versus placebo was a, a change of about one point. But if you actually look at this across the entire range of functions, uh, literally, and look at the percentage of patients who actually lose functions, the orange bars represent Avalon treated patients, the uh, gray bars represent placebo. Uh, literally in 16 out of 17 functions, there are fewer Adelaide treated patients that lose functions uh, in relation to placebo. So if you do an odds ratio on this, uh, that represents a 31% reduction in risk of loss of function across the entire uh, study population, not just a subgroup, uh, with a p-value, a highly statistically significant p-value of, of 0 0.01. Uh, so I think we're learning uh, new approaches to uh, analyze these clinical endpoints. As another example, we've uh, been working with PTC uh, looking at composite endpoints uh, using a composite of the six minute walk test and the time function test, 10 meter walk run, the four stair climb, and the four stair uh, descent. This was the study results looking at the percentages of patients with worsening of these uh, functions uh, across their two large placebo controlled trials. And if you actually do a composite of percentage of loss function, what you actually get is very consistent results looking at the uh, composite of average percent worsening in week uh, 48. So from their first study, uh, they had about, uh, the Adelaide treated patients had a, about a 20% reduction of p-value 0.02. Uh, in the second trial, about a 21.8% reduction with a p-value of 
006 in using a composite uh, endpoint, uh, which I think is a very exciting uh, development. I'd like to now shift into the regional workspace uh, that we've been working on at UC Davis. Uh, Dr. Hahn has really spearheaded this effort. He's now uh, moved over to uh, UC Irvine, uh, just south of us. We continue to uh, uh, collaborate on this. So this, uh, and I think uh, Linda really gave, uh, gave a nice uh, uh, introduction to these uh, concepts. Uh, and their, their uh, technique is very exciting uh, as well. This, uh, Dr. Hahn started this work about eight years ago in partnership with engineers from the UC Berkeley College of uh, Engineering. Uh, and uh, uh, this has progressed very nicely. The, the focus uh, initially has been on uh, shoulder and elbow uh, function. Those are, the, those are the upper limb groups that show the earliest changes uh, in non-ambulant uh, Duchenne. Uh, patients. Uh, and in humans, there's really a direct connection between ability to reach for objects uh, and ability to perform activities of daily living uh, and independence. Uh, so again, about six years ago, the Connect Gaming system uh, became uh, available, uh, and this was incorporated into uh, Dr. Hahn and the uh, group from UC uh, Berkeley's uh, system. Uh, again, low cost, very simple setup, uh, does not require any markers, and, and literally about a $200 uh, connect system uh, and a computer. So this is the uh, current uh, setup uh, for our system with a sensor to put, uh, display uh, and computer. Uh, if you could just, uh, if somebody could click on the uh, video here to start that. So this is this is uh, a able-bodied individual just showing the setup. Now we have actually purposely focused on the uh, upper limb in isolation. Uh, and our, our concern, uh, I, I think it's, it's very nice to look at the um, compensations of the trunk. Uh, we really wanted to focus on, on upper limb function and if, if somebody had a spine deformity or had uh, a uh, scoliosis procedure, we did not want to uh, have a system that perhaps could not be used uh, longitudinally in somebody who had uh, spine deformity uh, or a uh, spine system. But you can see this individual is going through a standard protocol. It takes about one minute uh, per arm uh, to actually uh, perform uh, the assessment and then reach it back towards their uh, uh, There's also, this system is able to actually calculate uh, arm length uh, very nicely. Uh, it can actually estimate uh, uh, joint contracture uh, at, the, at the elbow. And, um, very nice. Now you'll see the output here uh, momentarily uh, that is given uh, instantaneously uh, from the uh, system. Uh, So now you see the graphical representation, the analysis is completed. This actually shows the uh, essentially half of a hemisphere of a normal regional workspace uh, for that individual. It's a, re a relative surface area which is normalized to the, uh, to the upper limb uh, to um, account for size differences as well as, uh, as, well as maturational uh, changes. Now, if we can just start the next uh, clip, this is a Duchenne uh, patient uh, actually uh, again engaged in the, uh, uh, in the evaluation. And again, it takes about uh, one minute uh, per arm. Uh, so this is the intuitive graphical quantitative output that's uh, generated from this uh, assessment. There's very strong reliability uh, with motion capture systems with uh, 10 or 12 camera motion capture, capture systems and the test retest reliability about 0.93. Uh, the other uh, nice thing about this is it gives a very accurate estimate of the actual uh, arm uh, length measure. Uh, so this is actually the evaluator measured arm length versus the connect measured arm length. We're thinking this could actually be used in the context of a clinical trial to get an accurate representation of arm length for the purposes of pulmonary function uh, testing uh, and determination of percent predictive values for uh, pulmonary function. Uh, study. So uh, again, with the quadrant orientation, the upper quadrants, uh, the uh, ipsilateral on the, on the, on the uh, same side as quadrant three, the contralateral is quadrant uh, one. So we normalize this uh, to the individual's arm length, uh, and so all measures are, are normalized. And so with the Duchenne patient, again, you can see progression with the uh, Brooke uh, categories, very similar to what uh, Linda Lowe's 
showed, and we actually can plot this out on a radar plot uh, and actually show uh, a control value as well as a patient with Brook 1, Brook 2, uh, Brook 3, uh, and um, uh, 4, 5, and then uh, uh, a, a more impaired patient. Now, there is a ceiling effect that you see in the Brook 1 uh, population. Uh, and what we uh, can actually do with this uh, is we can actually weight the extremity uh, with a risk, a risk weight. Uh, so this is the situation where there's no loading uh, and then we can put 500 gram risk on it. You can see a reduction in the uh, reachable, uh, weight, uh, the reachable uh, workspace with the weighting of the risk. So again, no loading, loading. Again, this is the same individual showing uh, different relative surface areas with different uh, risk weights. So this is a functional measure of strength now that we can actually do in a, uh, a non-ambulant population. And the graph there on the lower uh, right actually shows uh, the changes that we see with loading of the wrist, uh, much in the same way as a at Brook scale, bringing a glass of water up to the mouth. Uh, we're able to quantitatively assess this now with no load, 500 gram load or a thousand gram load, you can see with the Duchenne patient the reduction in re reachable workspace with loading of the wrist. Uh, so uh, this actually can help deal with some of those ceiling effects that we're seeing uh, in perhaps even the late ambulatory patients as well as the early uh, non-ambulatory patients. Uh, and how's it related to actual function? These are the relationships with the neuropal scores. Uh, and again, the performance of upper limb uh, measure, which is uh, a measure that um, uh, the therapy community, uh, Tina Duong and uh, uh, Linda Lowe's have been involved in this. I was involved in the original uh, validation of this as well with the uh, European uh, group. Uh, and when you look at uh, the relationship between the reach of workspace and the full entry score, you see some nice uh, correlations. And in fact, in that lower right hand figure there, a 0.93 uh, correlation between the relative surface area of the regional workspace and the, perform the total score and the performance of upper limb uh, measure and correlations of, as well with the shoulder, middle, and distal uh, dimensions. Now we've been able to actually map these uh, relative surface area decreases to specific uh, dimensions on the pole. So for instance, the shoulder dimension on the pole maps very nicely to the uh, upper quadrant on the same side. The middle dimension on the pole uh, maps nicely to the upper and lower dimensions and then finally the distal dimension uh, maps very nicely to the uh, uh, to the ipsilateral lower dimension on the pole. We believe the, pole, the uh, uh, reachable workspace by connect will ultimately have uh, greater granularity and sensitivity uh, than perhaps the uh, pole will. Over the next years, uh, whether that's indeed the case. Uh, Dr. Hahn and his group uh, have a number of uh, publications uh, now, about uh, 15 publications uh, on their uh, system. Uh, this is just to acknowledge their uh, uh, grant funding. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Tina, uh, who's going to talk about the performance of upper limb. I'll try not to, uh, to uh, spit into this microphone. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Kathy, for allowing me to come and speak about the performance of upper limb. As you can see, it's the um, Pool 2.0, and uh, I'll explain that a little bit as we go on uh, during this, um, these, last, uh, these next few minutes. Um, for those of you here who have already heard about the pool, I apologize. This may be a little bit redundant, but just since there's, there's uh, people who have not heard about the pool or the performance of upper limb measure, I figure I'll give a, a little historical reference um, as to why it, um, it came about. I'm too short to actually see this. Um, um, why it came about, why we decided to, to develop a tool specific for DMD in the upper limb, um, where we are, what we have done with it, some of the publications, and then what are our future directions. So basically, what is what is the pool? The pool was a, an outcome tool that was developed out of a lot of meetings from an international outcomes working group that included um, clinicians, um, neurologists, um, PNR docs, uh, physical therapists, scientists, advocacy groups, as well as um, industry partners. So a lot of the people who uh, spoke today were. Uh, really important members in, in this group. And out of this, there's a paper um, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that basically 
tells you about the aims and our outcomes. That looked, this, this outcomes group looked at um, databases, large databases that looked at the natural history of DMD. And really the take home message I want for this specific talk is what did we find that led us to the performance of upper lip? We found that in, in staging of the disease and looking at the clinical outcomes that are used, we have outcome tools for ambulatory status, people who can walk and those who cannot walk. But we really are lacking in a tool that transitions the two. And so out of that, we decided to, um, to get a group of expert physical therapists together in an international group, um, multiple, multiple meetings, and develop a tool. And so in the, I just want to give you a, a really brief, a brief trailer of what this tool actually does so you can have an idea what this uh, what the tool is based on. So Kathy mentioned earlier about um, videos that were made by uh, the Claudia Senesak, uh, Michelle Eagle, and I uh, to, to educate and provide instruction for performance of some of the upper lip measures. And this is just a preview of uh, what's to come that will be available um, uh, through PPMD and their support as well. If you can play the video, please. The performance of the upper limb scale, or pull, is an assessment tool developed specifically to measure upper limb function in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a function-based evaluation designed by expert physical therapists who understand DMD, using valuable patient input to focus on movements that are required to perform daily activities important to individuals living with DMD. With Pull, we now have a validated patient-focused tool that assesses function throughout the entire spectrum of the disease. So that gives you a preview of some of the items that are, are shown in the pool. So, you know, yeah, some of these things are weights, but if you can imagine, these are movements that um, you perform on a daily basis. So just kind of get back on the conceptual framework. What led us and what's our theory behind why we did some of the things that we did? So in this framework, we wanted a adaptive screening tool. So the screening tool is like the book that was mentioned previously by Craig and Linda. Um, it's, you know, raising your arms above your head, getting your hand to your mouth, or manipulating something with your hand. We wanted to make sure that, you know, testing is long enough. So we want to make sure that for, to decrease the amount of time that's required for testing, we kind of did this adaptive screening tool or using the group so that it's kind of like a computer adapted testing. So we're not asking young men or boys to do things that they're not able to do. If they're not able to lift their hands above their head, we're not going to put a weight in their hand and ask them to lift it. And so just out of the um, just, um, consideration of time and effort that everybody puts into, uh, into um, evaluations, we wanted to make sure that we were sensitive to those kinds of things. And then from the um, framework of the continuum continuum of functional ability and the natural decline of DMD, we want to make this, um, this tool a movement-based uh, tool that looks at functional strength. So when you're looking at functional strength and motor performance, what plays into that? So we're looking at a tool that, wants, that we want to encompass the entire spectrum of disease, a disease that's diagnosed in childhood going into adulthood. One obvious thing to take into consideration is growth. And so we don't want um, cognitive growth or motor development to be an aspect if we're looking at functional strength itself. And then into motor performance, we want to make sure that this, this tool is able to assess muscle weakness and take into consideration contractures that do occur um, with, the, uh, with the disease progression. And so with this tool, we looked at three dimensions. Knowing that DMD is a progressive disease that starts proximally, we wanted to look at the shoulder level, the mid-level, and the distal level. And so the higher level dimensions are, are what we would expect for uh, uh, patients who are more ambulatory, have a little more strength to be able to do, and and, um, and, uh, and then eventually with the only ability to manipulate with the hands. And so we're hoping that this shows the progression of the disease. And so in the development, we wanted to make sure that we approach this in a very systematic fashion. In doing so, we did the most appropriate thing to review the upper or outcome measures that were available in neurovascular disease. And as you can see here listed, there are these uh, are the ones that we looked at. And so what we did is we pulled items from these measures that seem relevant to the uh, to do, uh, DMD in particular. And then out of these items, we um, developed the tool and then we had patients and families review the assessment tools, review how their, what kind of movements are, 
are required in, in, the, in these functional assessments and tell us, are these movements that you use every day? And the, this was really helpful for us because if we wanted to make a tool that was relevant for patients with DMD, we obviously need to be important input from them. And so from this, what we found is that most of the tools work, but there are some aspects of, of hand manipulation that is related to things that, that young men today um, uh, use in their hands, using the iPad and the phone, that keeps them engaged in the community, keep, keeps them engaged with their friends that are not available in, this, um, in any of the um, outcome tools we looked at. And so the pool added some distal dimensions that allowed us to be able to assess the use of fingers and hands um, that wasn't already ex in, in existence in the, in the current literature. And so, and because of that, just with this tool trying to, to capture such a large spectrum of the disease, we don't want a poor effect, meaning if someone's only able to use their fingers, we want to still be able to capture that too. Okay. And then as part of the scale development, of course, we have to make sure that we um, get proper psychometric uh, methodology into developing it. So we want to make sure it's robust, it has good reliability, validity, and, and, it's, and, and a good hierarchical scalability based on um, our, our, our clinical evaluations. And so the goal eventually was to linearize this measurement so that if we have one point change, it, it, it's, uh, it's going to be the same across the entire breadth of someone's ability. And so um, we had to, uh, I'm going to go for the next few minutes just talk about some of the publications that are associated with this development because in the process of developing an outcome measure tool of anyone you're familiar it's a long-winded process you have to make sure that you know what you're measuring it's reliable and, and it's uh, valid and uh, uh, makes sense so the first the first publication is a publication in the actual development of the tool we followed it up by um, a reliability study um, to in, in noise reduction as well as uh, as normal control so looking at the reliability and the validity of this tool itself and so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this paper because it explains a little bit about the, the the pool and, uh, and how it relates to disease progression itself. So pool 1.2 um, has a total school score of 72 points and uh, is divided into the shoulder, middle, and distal dimensions as I said before. Um, real quick, if you see in blue here, this is basically telling you in blue you see the boys who are ambulant and in red you see the boys who are not ambulant. So you see at the very top of the of the, of the screen here that most of the boys who are really ambulant have the higher scores. So on the y-axis, you see total pool scores, and on the x-axis, which is, nope, oh, yeah, x-axis here is the age, and so you see that most boys who are ambulatory have the higher set scores. There are very, very few boys who actually had a pool score. So that was good for us because we, we realized that the, the, there's not a ceiling um, effect, okay? Um, the bottom end with the boys who are in their, in their 30s, we're still able to measure them, and so we don't have a floor effect. So that was good news for us. And then this is just a quick, um, a quick diagram that um, that if you've seen a lot of slides, especially that the Craig's um, presented, you'll see that in the in the um, progression of the okay, forget the pointer. Um, in the yellow that's highlighted, you see that that's from the x-axis again is the um, is the age, and then the y-axis again is the total pool score. Um, you'll see in the shoulder dimension that there is there is there what's what looks like progression, but what it is is that boys are, are obtaining skills all the way up to about the age of seven, and then you see a pretty dramatic um, decline in this piecewise uh, regression model. But then you go to the middle dimension, you see that there is a, a slower, uh, a, 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 less, a less steep slope of gaining skills, but then also a less steep, steep slope of, of the uh, decline when they get to about 9 or 10. But then when you get to the distal dimension, um, you still get that, that, um, that gaining of skills up until about the age of 5, and the progression is a little bit lower. What's it, what it's telling us is that even the boys who have higher strength and you don't, you're not really thinking it or expecting them to have upper limb uh, weakness, we're still able to see that with this, with, this, uh, with this assessment. And so what's the result saying? The result saying that this has great intern and rate of reliability. Uh, proximal weakness is able to be detected in young ambulant boys as well as uh, non-ambulant boys who are not ambulant. It's sensitive to detect distal weakness and proximal weakness. 
and there's no floor effect. And, it's, and since this study was done in, in um, young men as well as boys um, uh, down to the age of five, it's suitable to, um, to the age about five. Okay? The next study is going to run through real quick um, just to show you some cost drug validity that's associated with other, other outcome measures that have been used in Duchenne. And, and one of the studies that have been done um, is the, the six-minute walk test. So this, this study looked at 164 boys. It didn't really show a good correlation, and the correlation was non-linear. Non um, and the, if you look at the six-minute walk average score, the pool average score, the six-minute walk average score is 376 meters. So these boys are, are pretty strong. And the pool score, having a high score of 74, and the mean is 70, you can see that their upper upper limb is pretty is pretty strong. So the take-home message really here is when they compare the meters walked in the six-minute walk test, you see the boys were able to walk over 400 meters. Most of them have really high scores. So the pool may not be as as sensitive or usable in that, that group of, of young men. But if you look at three to 400, there's more variability um, in that as we expect. But the most important thing that the take home message out of this paper really is that the pool is a really good transitional tool, especially if you're looking at young men who have a, a six minute walk test of 300 or less, so that you're able to capture an outcome that's gonna be able to bridge between ambulatory and non-ambulatory. And then I'm not gonna um, go here because Craig, uh, um, already uh, touched on this in his, his, his talk. But the one thing that I want to talk about is that uh, I found it interesting because the relative surface area was able to differentiate with the connect in, in certain domains that's related to the pool. In the shoulder, they're able to different, differentiate between shoulder flexion and abduction, RSA. While in the elbow, they're able to differentiate the ability for someone to bring their hands to their mouth, their hands to the table, um, lifting lifting and moving cans, or if you have to move something on a table, as well as like opening chips or removing a lid. And then on the distal piece, which was really interesting, because you wouldn't expect to be able to differentiate that much between picking up points on a table, and um, as you saw in the previous video, the diagram, but the, the, um, the um, connect system was able to do that. So this is indirectly related, but also really important to mention. Uh, we have a paper that um, has been submitted, and it's a, it's, it was, it was, it was um, developed in parallel with the pool and with the same International Clinical Outcomes Working Group. And the point in this is that we wanted to make sure that seeing that the uh, upper limb measures are not sensitive enough to, to detect change in young men or boys with Duchenne, we want to make sure there is a, a, a patient reporting outcome that is designed specifically by clinicians who are experts in DMD as well as patients and families to see what's relevant to you. What is relevant in, in, in your daily activities requiring the use of your upper limbs that means something. So if there is change but, and there's something that's going to be life altering, would be, we would be able to capture it, being that this tool is specifically made for DMT. Um, and this tool is based on guidelines from the FDA for development of psychometric um, tools. And it's a 32 item um, uh, looking at activities of daily living, including food, self care, house and environment, leisure, and communication. The important thing here is that it is, is an international patient reported outcome measure. It was done um, by seven international international centers both in the US and um, Europe and um, the mean age is about 16 years old and we had a combination of boys who were ambulant and non-ambulant and the reliability when, um, when performed was really high so uh, look out for this paper it should be coming soon so now why 2.0 we already have 1.2 and it looks like it's a good measure why are we bothering with 2.0 the reason is we're really lucky that there's that a lot of industry partners allowed us to implement this tool as an exploratory outcome in clinical trials. And through that development, we found that um, we could make it better. We could make it more efficient. We can clarify some of the um, operational definitions and scoring better, which led to 2.0. So quickly on this, this is a busy slide. You don't have to know anything besides the fact that we took some really difficult um, shoulder dimension items and we looked at see what seems to measure the same thing. We took those out, and that's the same thing with the distal piece. If anything repeated itself, we took it, we took it out. And then more importantly, and I think the clinical evaluators in the room can really appreciate this, some of the items had zero to five different domains and scoring. We reduced it down to three very similar to the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, and, and operationally defined each one of those. Um, so a zero is you're not able to do it, 
A one, you can do the task in a modified fashion, and a two, you can do it without any compensations at all. It sounds really simple, but we have all of the compensations and everything defined so that um, so the clinical evaluators can do this reliably. And when we compare the reliability between 1.2 and 2.0 in a very small subset of um, individuals, we found the reliability was really high in both 1.2 and 2.0. Current rationalysis shows that it is actually improved, and there's a better fit and higher correlation, as well as improved ordering and threshold response. What's, what's that really mean? What it means is that the disease progression really reflects the logical order of what we see in clinical development. That's kind of the point in rationale analysis, using statistics and clinical expertise to really understand and develop the scale. So again here, quick thing, in yellow are the new, is the new total score, and in white was the old score. So you can see it's, um, uh, it's, it's quite reduced, and that's mainly because of the reduction in the amount of, the, the, the amount of, of scores per item. So what are our future plans? We have a manuscript that's going to convert the raw scores from 1.2 to 2.0, uh, repeat reliability, and just so that um, you know, some of the uh, the, the 1.2 as well as the 2.0 have been implemented. This is kind of a 30,000 foot view of, of where it's been used. It's for the studies who have, have uh, come on a little bit later are currently using 2.0, we're phasing out 1.2, and that's the reason why we have the publication that's, that's going to be comparing the two. Uh, Minute, just for the sake of time, I'll quickly go through this. Um, so basically, this tool is good for ambulatory and non-ambulatory. Has good reliability, good construct validity with the six-minute walk test, and concurrent validity validity with the reachable workspace. Um, it um, has the has a good. It's a good functional functional strength endpoint, and it's been presented at the FTA and the EMA, and it has been, it has been well been, been well received by both. Manuscripts that are currently in draft about the pool um, are the comparison study as well as the longitudinal study in order for us to assess the sensitivity of the tool itself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. So we heard of um, three tools of performance of upper limb, and now we're going to hear from Krista Vanderborn, who's going to discuss MRI findings. So what's actually going on in those muscles in the upper limb? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first off, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is always the meeting that I look forward to because it's quite an inspirational meeting where we have so many engaged parents. We have the boys here, we have representatives from industry, we have scientists, and we have uh, representatives here from federal agencies, all really with one goal, and that is to help find the cure for Duchenne. So, this has been a bit of a roller coaster year. On one hand, when we sit back, we really realize this is an exciting time with so many different therapeutic targets moving forward towards clinical trials. But it has also been a bit of a realization that designing clinical trials in Duchenne is really complex. And we really are looking for more tools that allow us to look at the efficacy of different therapeutic strategies. And so, you've heard a lot already about different tools that are being proposed particularly looking at non-ambulatory boys as well as ambulatory boys. So our group has really been focused on the development and validation of magnetic resonance imaging in the Shen muscular dystrophy with the goal of moving them into clinical trials. We started a large multi-center natural history study using magnetic resonance imaging and this was done across three different sites, uh, the University of Florida, which is where I'm housed, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, and uh, Oregon Health Science University in Portland. So in this study, we've been following boys with Duchenne, we've been looking at the lower extremity muscles, and doing animal measurements in order to determine which of the MR measurements are most sensitive to disease progression, so that we understand which would be valuable in natural, in, in terms of which are the most sensitive measurements for clinical trials. In the initial study, which was funded by NIH, focused on the lower extremity muscles of ambulatory boys. We were last year refunded and we're now transitioning to non-ambulatory boys. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'll show you first some of the data from the lower extremity muscles, and then I'll then shift over to the upper extremity muscles. As Tina pointed out, and I think uh, it has been pointed out several times, it's really important that we have outcome measures 
that are sensitive throughout these different stages of disease progression. So both as boys are younger as well as when they're older. So at this point, we have enrolled a total of 146 boys with Duchenne and 53 controls. Uh, the current age in terms of the group that we're including are boys that are ages 5 to 18 years old. And right now we have 31 boys that are non-ambulatory enrolled in our study. So when we're talking about magnetic resonance imaging for clinical trials, it's a little bit different than what you do when you go for a diagnostic MRI. Typically for diagnostic MRI, images are optimized for the radiologist to visually inspect the image and to make a diagnosis. When we're talking about magnetic resonance imaging in clinical trials, you really need to extrapolate quantitative information. And so that's a little difference, but ultimately you need to be able to do statistical analysis on the data that are obtained. And that's not what a radiologist typically does. So in the context of imaging DMD, uh, we've been using two approaches. We use different MR imaging sequences, and then we also use what's called MR spectroscopy. It uses the same machine, same magnet, but rather than getting an image, you get a spectrum. And that allows you to quantitatively look at different biocompound compounds. So obviously an important advantage of magnetic resonance imaging, unlike a muscle biopsy, is that it's non-invasive. It also it is an objective measure. It doesn't depend on whether the boy has a good day, a bad day, the data are what they are. And then I think another important point that's sometimes overlooked when we're talking about muscle biopsy is that you look at a large sampling volume. With a biopsy, you're looking at a very specific region. With MRI, you can look at many muscles simultaneously. And then as I pointed out, you can look at muscle structure, but you can also look at the underlying muscle pathophysiology. So this slide here shows you a T1-weighted MR image. This is taken of the upper part of the leg, so the upper leg and thigh muscles. On the left side, you have a control healthy muscle. On the right side, you have a muscle of a child with Duchenne. And so the first thing I want to point out is so uh, that you see that in this type of muscle, the type of image, the subcutaneous fat looks bright. So on these images, uh, muscle looks grayish, and typically in a healthy muscle, the signal is quite homogeneous. And I was looking for a big point for that. I don't think I have one. So the, hom the signal is quite homogeneous because the muscle fibers are really nicely organized. They're kind of next to each other. Okay. Whereas if you look at the child with your shed, you can see that it's, there's a lot more structure there and there's a lot of regions of hyperintensity or brightness. That's because the muscle is progressively being replaced by fat, by intramuscular fat. The other point I want to make is that we already know the disease is quite variable across boys, but it's also variable when you're looking at different muscles. So you can see that, for instance, in the hamstrings, there are several muscles that are very bright that are almost completely replaced by fat, whereas the neighboring muscles, the muscle on the really on the complete right side, there is a gracilis, is relatively well preserved. So I want you to keep that in mind. So of course you want to quantitatively look at this fat fraction inside of these muscles in boys with Duchenne across different ages. So on the top we have uh, images taken from the upper part of the leg, so this is the vastus lateralis that we quantified, and the bottom is one of the calf muscles, it's the soleus, it's a deeper calf muscle. And so what you see, first of all, if you look on the left side, in control in yellow, that the fat fraction in healthy muscle in young boys is really, it does not change with age, it's very constant. Whereas if you look at the children with Duchenne, you can see that across different ages, the older boys are, the higher this fat fraction, but it's quite progressive with a more rapid rate of progression in the proximal muscle, the vastus lateralis, than the lower leg muscle, the soleus. We also looked at the same boys one year later, so this is uh, data acquired now at the 12-month time point, and you can see that across in all of the different age groups, we were able to detect the increase in fat fraction in these muscles in all of the, age, in all of the boys. You can again see a, a more rapid progression in the vastus lateralis than in the soleus muscle. <coughs> For those of you who are interested, this is just, as you know, in developing MR biomarkers, it's really important that we look at sensitivity. And so this shows you on the top, again, the fat fraction measured in the muscles using spectroscopy, showing that the change over the 12-month period is highly significant. 
We also look at another measure that's called tube MRI that is essentially a compilation of both muscle damage as well as fat infiltration. And you can see that across all of the muscle, you can detect a highly significant change over the course of 12 months, except for one muscle. And that's a one muscle that I pointed out earlier, the gracilis, that somehow seems to be much more preserved. This was done, I should point out, over a total of 97 boys. This next slide shows you here the trajectory of the changes in fat fraction across all of the boys that are enrolled in our study. So in red, you can see the overall disease trajectory or the mean disease trajectory across the different ages. But what I really would like you to pay attention to as well is the amount of variability that exists across the boys. So you have some of the boys that are sitting more on the right side on, on high age that have relatively low levels of fat, fat inside of the muscle. So these are the boys that presumably may have genetic modifiers that are more protective potentially. And then you have boys that are on the left side of this curve that progress so much faster. So overall, the take-home message is that there is quite a bit of variability, which I think was very important when we talk about clinical trials. Now, one of the key questions that, of course, that we wanted to ask is, well, is MR more sensitive than the current measure that's, that's used in MR boy boys, and that's the six-minute walk test? Because that's what was ultimately an important question for us. So there were a couple of different ways that we looked at it. But one way we did is by grouping our boys, all of the boys that were enrolled, we grouped them into four quartiles. So based on their change in the six-minute walk test. So the boys that are indicated in that first quartile, these are boys that actually, when you looked at the distance in their six-minute walk, improved over the course of one year. So these are probably the younger boys. And then the quartile two, those are the boys that were stable over the course of one year. And the question was, would we still be able to detect with MR changes in their muscle pathology? And the answer was yes. So on the top here, you have the changes in fat fraction, as well as the changes in T2 MRI in boys that improved in terms of their six minute walk on top. And the bottom one is the boys that were stable. So these data indicated to us that the MR measurements were quite sensitive. So the next question, of course, is when we're looking at MR measurements, it's one thing to be sensitive to be reproducible, but ultimately, do they correlate with clinically meaningful functional measures? And so in order to do that, every time that we took MR images, we also performed all of the time tests that are typically done in ambulatory boys, specifically the 10-meter walk run, the stair climbing, get up from spine, and the six-minute walk test. And we looked at the correlation between all of our MR measures and these functional time tests. And so here the graph shows you on the uh, y-axis you see the six-minute walk test, on the bottom on the uh, x-axis you see the vestus lateralis fat fraction. And so there's two points I would like to make in this image. First off, that you can see that as the fat fraction increases as you move to the right, there is a decline in the six-minute walk test, showing the relation between these two parameters. But then I would also like you to look at, if you look at the very bottom here, you can see that the boys that had zero for their six minute walk test, in other words, that are non ambulatory, they all had fat fractions above 0 0.4. None of the boys that were not that, that were non ambulatory had frac fractions over 0 .4, 0 0.4. So, next we looked at, like I said, the correlation between all of these different parameters. And so, we put all the time points together. So, we had a total of 421 time points, and each of the time points were treated as separate observations. And what we found that the overall take-home message was that the MR measurements correlated well with the functional measurements, with stronger correlations in the upper leg muscles, the more proximal muscles, than the distal muscles. Again, it was one muscle that behaved very differently. You can see that here in the lighter colors. That's the gracilis that just does not seem to correlate very well. So the next question was, well, would MR be sensitive to the uh, to therapeutic interventions. And of course, uh, the therapeutic intervention that we really selected for a proof of principle was corticosteroids. We do know as a community that corticosteroids do slow down the disease progression and specifically the delay the loss of ambulation. So as a proof of principle, we looked at the effect of corticosteroids on the MR measurements. And so we did this a couple of different ways. But the most important one is we looked at the group of young boys ages 5 to 8 
that was corticosteroid naive at baseline, and then one group started corticosteroids, and the other group decided to delay the start of corticosteroids. And we looked at the three month changes in the MR measurements and six month changes. And so, what you can see is when you look at the change in T2 MRI, almost a complete dichotomy between the two groups. So, clearly, the boys that were on corticosteroids uh, all showed a decrease in their MRI T2 measurements. Whereas the boys that were corticosteroid naive either stayed the same or they increased. That was over a period of just three months. When we looked at the six month change, we saw that same phenomenon but even more pronounced. So clearly, the MR was able to detect the effect of corticosteroids on skeletal muscle. So, where are we today? We do feel that there is quite a bit of data out there now showing that the MR measurements are reproducible. I didn't show that here today, but there's, there's, that's certainly been demonstrated. The measurements are sensitive. We believe they correlate very well with functional measurements and that uh, they certainly are uh, sensitive to the effect of corticosteroids. So at this point, we've worked with a number of different uh, groups in industry to really implement MRI in clinical trials. So this is happening right now. A lot of work has been done over the last 18 months. And you can see that, so here's a list of uh, four different sponsors that are using MRI in their clinical trials, including as primary outcome measures. There are a number of other groups there as well. So at this point, uh, we are continuing to do measurements in the lower extremity because we have the opportunity to really get eight to 10 year natural history data, which is very, very important. But we also want to really tackle the upper extremity muscles now. We know that there's a large group of boys out there that are non-ambulatory and are not always included in clinical trials. So our focus has been on looking at what we think are functionally important upper extremity muscles. We heard from Tino later, earlier in the importance of being able to lift your arm. We really want to make sure that we are looking at important functional measures. So our focus has been to look at the biceps and triceps muscles as well as the shoulder girdle. And this is here a slightly different set, so I'll orient you. This is here actually now a water image, image that's, contained, uh, that's obtained using Dixon imaging. This is a slice here directly through your arm, upper arm. So on the top, BB stands for the biceps muscle, and the, and the other one is the triceps. So in these type of images, if you look at the subcutaneous fat now, you can see that that's all dark. So in these type of images, fat will appear dark. So if you look at the, this is a child here, a 13-year-old that's non ambulatory you look at the images now, you can see all these dark regions inside the muscle. That's because the muscles are being replaced by fat. You can see that it's highly prevalent in the biceps muscle, and you certainly see it as well triceps. We've also looked now at the deltoid muscle. So the deltoid is, is this muscle here, very important muscle. And so you can see that on the image it kind of wraps around this muscle. So it's a little bit, you know, kind of funny to look at. But essentially you slice it right through here. Again on the left side you have the control, on the right side a non ambulatory boy, 13 years old, with Duchenne. Two things I want you to, to observe. One is, again, you see these darker regions in the deltoid muscle. But also notice the muscle is a lot smaller. So that's something that we're noticing in the upper external primitive muscles. There is a lot more muscle wasting than what, we, than what we see in the lower extremity. And of course, we're still learning a lot. It's pretty important. But that's in general what we are observing. So at this point, we have quantified the fat fraction in the upper extremity muscles now number of voices is still relatively pilot, but I think enough to sort of share the data with you. So again, on the left side here, we have the biceps muscle, on the right side, the deltoid. Uh, in yellow control, we know the controls are very low, there's really only two, it's a very small percentage, it's somewhere around 2%. But then what you do see that starting at the age group of seven to nine years old, you can see an increase in the fat fraction already in the biceps, and it progressively increases uh, Also, we're looking at, similar to what we've done in the lower extremity muscles, we are measuring T2 MRI in the upper extremities, and this shows you here the values in the shoulder muscles in red, upper arm muscles in green, and the forearm muscles. Overall, we know that T2 MRI is always elevated in boys with the shed, even at the youngest of ages. So here, what you can see is that, uh, obviously, it's elevated in the upper extremity muscles as well, and it seems to be the highest values are uh, present in the shoulder muscles. This was done on a total of 37 boys so far, of which 15 were non-ambulatory. Uh, 
finally, we're looking also, of course, again at the correlation between these upper extremity biomarkers of MR and functional measures. We've gone ahead, as Tina pointed out, we are using the poll uh, 2.0 at this point. We're also looking at my tools that we hope to use to reach the workspace. We have not quite done that yet. If you look on the left side, you'll see the correlation between the poll, between the biceps T2, uh, triceps T2, as well as the Dixon measurements of fat fraction. And you can see there's a strong correlation, even though it's a relatively small sample size. So overall, I think the summary is that we feel quite confident that the lower extremity quantitative MR measurements are sensitive to disease progression. They correlate with function, they're sensitive to clinical steroids, and they're moving into clinical trials. In terms of the upper extremity, it is more challenging than the lower extremity. You have to remember the body part has to be in the center of the magnet, so it's harder to get on an arm than a leg. But it can be successfully implemented, and so at this point, we really are trying to obtain natural history data the technology so that ultimately this technique can be used also in clinical trials, hopefully in non ambulatory uh, patients. And I would just like to uh, acknowledge, first of all, the parents and families. We do ask our boys to travel to one of our sites. They have been very dedicated. Uh, these data have been really tremendously val val valuable. And I really want to thank all of the boys, the families that come and participate in this natural history study. And then, of course, uh, there are a number of scientists that really have, have made it. Uh, a big impact. I certainly would like to acknowledge Glenn Walter, uh, Bill Moody, Sean Forbes, Rebecca Wilcox, who talked earlier today about one Florida, and Lee Sweeney, who's also been a big proponent of our energy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Krista. We have a couple of minutes for questions, and there are questions on the floor. So I have a question for Krista. So yeah. yeah, thank you. So uh, at this point, uh, the FDA is, is aware of the work that we are doing. As I said, there are a number of clinical trials that are now using imaging in the clinical trials. We're in the early process of, in terms of going for qualification. So particularly Sweeney has been uh, has been pushing this for very hard. We have had initial communications with CPAD about their willingness to help us, and then Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy has been generously offered to help facilitate that. So as far as the poll in the, the two original workspaces, could you all maybe give us some indication about what the differences are, or why companies would maybe prefer to use one over the other? What are the advantages of your, let's do that. What are the advantages of your system, your tool? It might be easier to invite you all to the technology resource fair. I believe Craig's going to have his system, and I'm going to have my system. We're going to collect data on all abilities, all ages, so healthy, controlled parents. Um, but I think the, the thing that we were striving to get is motivation so we can get a consistent performance. Um, and we differ in the fact that we really believe that functional reaching is more um, more important to, to the child than, than straight, plain movements. We're excited about our, our, that we can test boys with very limited function and that we've collected data in the school systems of healthy controls. And boys with Duchenne, even very able ones, cannot perform quite as well as, as the healthy controls. So we think we could really take very young kids all the way through very limited ability kit. So please join us at the Technology Resource Fair. Is this on? Okay. So again, I, th I think that with regard to this system, uh, our, our approach really was to, to isolate uh, upper limb uh, function, uh, take out some of the motivational aspects to it, as well as the um, compensatory act action of, of the trunk, which may uh, potentially produce uh, variability over time, particularly if there's um, development of spinal deformity or if uh, a, a patient had spinal orthrodesis uh, for a, uh, with regard to a, a spine fusion. Uh, so essentially, uh, the system, I think, is uh, very elegant in terms of its ability to normalize for uh, arm length 
uh, it's able to actually uh, estimate uh, contracture as well. And I think the loading uh, paradigm <clears throat> where you actually <clears throat> can uh, weight the risk uh, with a weight actually potentially can be useful, I think, for a, um, uh, uh, a stronger patient uh, in terms of dealing with some of the, the uh, ceiling uh, activity. I think uh, what we're learning with the poll is that I think the, the shoulder dimension and the middle uh, dimension really tends to change more uh, over the course of one to two years uh, in a clinical trial. The distal dimension doesn't, doesn't tend to move uh, very much, and I think that uh, perhaps there's less of a, a steroid res, uh, responsiveness to the poll and looking at the uh, distal uh, dimension uh, as well. So I think uh, these connect systems, I think again, uh, I think both systems have their uh, have their advantages, and I think both can be applied. I think they will provide more granularity uh, and sensitivity uh, to the movement in terms of sh loss of shoulder function and elbow function. Uh, I think we're probably going to have to rely more on some of the Maya tools and some of the distal uh, measurements of, of function uh, overall, overall as, as uh, we're really looking at distal functions in, in older uh, patients. But I think uh, both these Connect systems, uh, I think, are going to be very useful for the uh, early and uh, mid-decade non-ambulant patients in terms of looking at the shoulder and elbow dimensions. Um, besides the fact that I think the pool in general can, uh, uh, it's a good complementary tool or an, an adjective tool that could be used both in, with the MRI as well as with any of the regional workspaces. I think uh, um, there's potential in adding granularity. I think that we have to really think of outcome measures from the standpoint of looking at impairment or organ base. If, are you looking at strength? Or are you looking at function? And um, sometimes um, the 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 strength-based measures do, do not always um, show as much. Show to, do not always are not always indicated to be more sensitive than the, the functional-based measures, and so that's something to just take into consideration um, whenever you're looking at outcome measures. And there's a you know there's not it's not one or the other. A lot of times it's a, it's a it's a, a toolbox. Does the pool demonstrate range of motion? Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it, it's more active. It's it's active. And so um, there's there's one aspect where we where we do look at being able to turn your hand over, um, but besides that, it's 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 entirely function based. Okay, so both of the other systems would demonstrate range of motion. Your sense of strength and your sense. Well, it, it, they, they measure essentially active active range of motion. Uh, I, th I think the active system, uh, Linda, you would you would measure more to trunk compensation as well as in addition to active range of motion, right? Any, those are all my questions. Does anybody else have any questions you want to ask? If not, I guess we'll break a couple of minutes early. I know that will break everyone's heart. So thank you very much to our panel members. And